Uh, thanks all of you for being here this morning or afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from in your time zone. Uh, my name is Christine Tsai. I am CEO and founding partner of 500 Startups. I am honored to be part of this illustrious group of investors to have a, a great conversation about a very important topic, which is uh, supporting uh, female founders, meaning both investing and deploying capital into, as well as access and resources to mentorship. Uh, before we kick things off, I wanted to share a bit more and set the stage for, for why this matters and what inspired 500 to launch this female forces um, initiative, especially now during a very uncertain period of time. So according to a, a recent UN policy brief, there's emerging evidence that the economic fallout of COVID-19 will disproportionately affect women. Um, there's a quote, women's economic and productive lives will be affected disproportionately and differently from men across the globe. Women earn less, save less, their capacity to absorb economic shocks is therefore uh, less than that of men, um, unfortunately. And as we're all painfully aware, female founders have been historically under, um, I'm sorry, overlooked by venture capitalists, um, you know, even in terms of the total capital invested in female founding teams had a slight increase um, from 2018 to today, but it was really 2.2% to 2.8%. So really um, very minor progress, if at that. And now due to COVID, we are in danger of losing progress that has been made and the efforts at hand. Investors oftentimes will err on the side of being conservative um, during times of crisis and uncertainty and might consider retreating into what they think are, I have to do the air quotes, safer investments, um, more familiar investments and in founders, which unfortunately may not include women or underrepresented minorities. So to that end, 500 decided to uh, survey female founders to, do, to understand what are the challenges they face during this time, which some believe will be worse than the 2008 recession. So here's what we found. The majority, 56%, stated that they're still fundraising. Two thirds believe they'll be disproportionately affected by COVID. As a result, they could receive less funding at a time when nearly 70% say they only have at most six months of runway left. One third indicated that running a company while having to take care of family members at home has been very difficult or impossible to manage. The top challenges female founders are currently facing, customer acquisition, 46%, increasing runway, 34%, and maintaining a healthy work-life balance, 25%. These results validate our concerns as to why it's more important now more than ever to, to maintain that commitment to investing and in supporting female founders. I'll conclude with this. Um, you know, as we mentioned when 500 announced the, the Female Forces Initiative to reaffirm our commitment to investing in uh, female-led companies, our pledge was as follows. Uh, increasing the percentage of female founders in our accelerator. We feel that with the, the new rolling admissions accelerator model we announced um, a, a little while back, that more female founders would have the flexibility to apply to and attend our program. Two, increasing our global outreach to find the best female-led companies. And third, offering more resources to female founders, including asset, access to mentors, advisors, um, and investors. All right, with that, I'm honored to introduce our moderator for today, Ruth Umo, um, as a reporter at Forbes who covers diversity and inclusion in business and society at large. Ruth knows firsthand the, the issues facing women and minorities. Her recent articles include an, a piece on the latest Google diversity report, which showed modest gains for women and people of color and Morgan Stanley taking its accelerator for underrepresented startup founders virtual because of the COVID pandemic. I will now hand it over to you, Ruth. Hopefully all of you can hear me and thank you so much for that warm introduction, Christine. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, if I heard correctly, more than 300 people signed up to tune into today's webinar. Not to be presumptuous, but I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say that I'm looking forward to what will undoubtedly be an insightful conversation. I was going to intro myself, but Christine uh, did that for me. Thank you very much. So instead, what I'll start off doing is have each of my uh, esteemed panelists uh, introduce themselves. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. This is Wendy Teleke. Can you hear me? 
Hi, uh, my name is Wendy Teleki, and I'm uh, the head of the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, which is a initiative house at the World Bank that supports the multilateral development banks to run programs to uh, help women entrepreneurs in emerging markets. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Nora Megavena. I'm based in Los Angeles and I'm a founding partner of Mila Capital, an early stage fund investing in tech you can touch. And I'm also a lead investor with Portfolio's Rising America Fund. Hey everyone, I'm Kelly Goldstein. I'm a senior associate at Harlem Capital Partners. We invest in women and minority founders at the seed and series A stage. I'm really excited to be here today and super pumped about the female forces initiative. So thank you to the 500 startups teams for hosting this discussion today and including me as well. Hi, Ali Burns, CEO of Village Capital. We accelerate and invest in seed stage impact driven entrepreneurs and we have a particular interest in identifying and supporting founders who are sitting in what we think are investor blind spots, whether it's because of geography, gender, race, or other biases. And I'm so excited to be here today. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. Uh, oh. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll start if that's okay. Um, I'm Brittany Davis. I'm an investment principal at Backstage Capital. Um, Backstage is a fund that was started by Arlen Hamilton about five years ago. Um, we've invested in over 130 founders and focus on underrepresented founders, so women, people of color, and LGBTQ founders. Hi, everyone. I'm Shruti Chandrasekhar. I'm with the IOC, uh, which is part of the World Bank Group. I lead a program called Startup Catalyst that focuses on investing in seed funds in emerging markets. And I also work with Wendy, who leads WeFi to enable a, a lot of the financing for women entrepreneurs. Um, and I already introduced myself, but I'm, I'm Christine Tsai I'm with 500 Startups. All right, I think that's everyone. Thank you for those introductions. Let's dive right into the topic matter at hand. Uh, for any startup, fundraising is obviously a crucial step, but there have been a myriad of factors that limit both women and people of color as they create and scale businesses. As Christine already stated, half of the female founders surveyed are currently fundraising, yet 10% predict to make their fundraising goal um, in the same amount of time. 40% predict that it will take more time and 20% predict less funded. You all are clearly entrenched in the startup ecosystem and really have on the ground knowledge uh, regarding the challenges that businesses are currently facing. What are you all observing in your respective portfolios? Uh, maybe I can start. This is Wendy Teleki from uh, WeFi. Uh, we are um, a program that funds uh, the multilateral development banks to support entrepreneurs through banking and uh, funds, uh, insurance, other activities. So we work broadly, and I just wanted to give a few comments that were more, um, you know, at the, the broader perspective, because I know uh, many of the other participants will have very specific portfolio information. Um, but what we're seeing from the entrepreneurs that our um, partners are funding um, and you know the the funds that they're supporting is there's really three things happening. There's a retrenchment happening with many women where, uh, as as you've mentioned, their funding and their runways are uh, very short. They don't have a lot of money, and they're really just in a in a very serious crunch period trying to make it through and figure out what the recovery is going to look like and how long that's going to be. And that uncertainty is very severe. Um, but there's another that's really working on pivoting, and we see a lot more women who are thinking about how do they change their business model to uh, really adapt and go after new revenue streams. And I wanted to highlight a third group that we're seeing stories about, which are women who are positioned to grow in this environment, uh, women who are in healthcare and education, um, in certain sectors, digital sectors, they can really take advantage of uh, this new world. They have a business model that really works. And so, you know, seeing, uh, you know, how we can support all three of those groups is really important. And I'll, I'll hand it over to some of the other speakers to talk about, you know, more specifics in their portfolios. 
Yeah, thanks, Wendy. I definitely agree with everything you said about pivoting, and that's an example I would like to give. But um, firstly, our portfolio companies at Harlem Capital Partners have, for the most part, been really lucky. A lot of them kind of just finished fundraising, so they have about 24 months on average um, in runway, which is great. We are recommending that startups have 18 months or more. Just the last um, downturn we saw lasted about 18 months, and this could, you know, could be the same. It could be worse. So that's definitely the advice we're giving to them. And also, um, as Wendy noted, pivoting has been something we've seen our founders do very well. Um, one in particular is Claire Coder from AmpFlow. It's a B2B menstrual product company. They serve you know, in-person businesses like corporate offices or schools, which of course are closed right now. And so she had to pivot to sustain her business throughout this downturn and realize that as an FDA certified business, she could refocus her production to create PPE instead of tampons and pads. And so now she is delivering PPE to businesses that have frontline workers and um, is actually winning more contracts now. And they're actually larger than the contracts she would have gotten prior um, to the pandemic. So she's in a really good place and has moved extremely quickly to, to be able to make this pivot. So I think, you know, being agile and thinking about other revenue streams um, is really important during this time. You know, in our, in our, you know, in our, portfolio, what we're finding is that once companies move beyond the seed round, um, they're, they're in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, the Kaufman Fellows Research Center uh, shared data recently and said that if when women um, owned companies make it past seed, they end up actually raising more capital than, than um, companies led by men. And uh, we're certainly finding that in our portfolio, the challenges aren't very different from what Christine summarized from the survey. I think uh, decisions around staffing, staffing cuts and salary cuts are really weighing heavily. Um, but when it comes to pre-seed companies and the type of company we might see come through um, portfolio, you know, women, women as breadwinners, the women's wealth gap shared um, just a couple of days ago that in 40% of families, women are the primary breadwinner. Um, but it's the number just goes up increasingly. It's 52% of Latinas. It is 67% of Native American mothers, and it's 81% of Black mothers. And so if you can imagine, you know, how we're all struggling at home to balance and, and what that means when you're trying to um, raise capital for a company. Um, additionally, the Pew study shared that 49% of Latinos say someone in their household has taken a pay cut or lost a job, according to, you know, in, in this pandemic. And that compares to just about a third of all adults. So the communities uh, of color are, are definitely disproportionately affected. And, uh, and I think we see the impact in a much, much greater way at the pre-seed level, anything pre-seed. Yeah, I can speak to yeah, that. I can seed level. Um, so backstage capital, most of our investments um, have been at pre-seed or seed stage. Um, so yeah, I can definitely confirm that the vulnerability um, is definitely amplified at the pre-seed level because most of those companies hadn't raised a ton of capital to begin with. Um, but one interesting thing is that we were kind of seeing the confirmed statistics that female founded companies or female led companies tend to generate more revenue per dollars raised. Um, we had seen that in our portfolio to this point. And a lot of them were relying on consumer markets in terms of essentially getting your capital from your customers versus VC and relying on uh, venture capital. So it's been um, kind of a range of outcomes in our portfolio where some have been in a really strong position already um, addressing a problem digitally or in some type of health or something like that education that was digital and then some have had to pivot entirely and then some are also making some strategic kind of cuts and kind of being defensive that way to preserve runway um, but one I guess an opportunity that, that we're seeing quite a bit is essentially looking at what their core offering was and then seeing what will like long-term, like a post-COVID situation be like and starting to already make those moves to address what's currently going on and then also position themselves for a future beyond what's going on today. 
Um, one example, just real quick from our portfolio, um, Care Academy is essentially an online digital platform for training um, caregivers. So particularly focusing on a senior, a senior community. And they also went through Village Capital. So I'm sure Allie uh, remembers Care Academy. And right now she's actually doing very well um, and just sharing some of her story. They, as soon as kind of the situation with COVID got very serious, they launched an online course uh, prevent, or is talking about preventing the spread of COVID and how to treat and care for um, and the elderly population in a, in a safe way with the COVID crisis. And she's been able to continually, I think she's in a fundraise right now um, that's going successfully because she's able to talk to what she's doing right now, but then also how that uh, will transition to a post kind of COVID world. So it's that really kind of quick action, but then also to kind of transcending what we're going through um, at the immediate moment. Uh, so the one thing that I'd like to, to say is that we are actively investing. So we have not pulled back from the market and we are trying to to support our startups as much as possible during these tough times. Um, uh, in terms of uh, some of the examples of the other panelists uh, spoke of ring 100% true in our portfolio as well. And the challenges ring true as well. So for example, we have a company in South Asia that is a company founded by two women that focuses on uh, providing education to, to preschool children. And they, they run it using a community of, uh, of mothers. Um, and with, uh, with limitations on mobility and movement, they've been severely hampered. And so the first thing that they did was develop uh, an online product that could be used, but not just an online product that works uh, on, you know, uh, internet connections that have great bandwidth, but even on a very basic feature phones. So they, they, they have a, uh, an online product and a phone product so that uh, kids in all uh, segments of uh, the socioeconomic strata can access the product and still gain an education. Uh, and the other thing that we've seen is there are some businesses where the, that have benefited from the crisis. Uh, uh, for example, we have um, a number of investments in the logistics sector. And so we have seen, because people are now confined at home, they are ordering everything in every market. And you could look at companies in Africa, you could look at companies in the Middle East, you could look at companies in India. Uh, people are, are, are confined to being at home, and, but they still need access to groceries, they still need access to medicines. And so we have seen um, an increase of activity uh, in that space. Uh, so, so the crisis has, has led to people uh, responding in multiple different ways, and we're doing our best to support our employees. Yeah, and I just add very similar sentiments in terms of what we're seeing across um, our alumni and our portfolio. Um, a chunk of entrepreneurs who are unfortunately experiencing uh, near halts in revenue um, and trying to manage through the, the subsequent cuts and layoffs that go with that. Uh, a number of companies who um, have healthy runways, um, maybe not 24 months or 18 months, um, but are looking at fundraising now when they weren't necessarily planning on going out into the market and are looking for investors who are still writing checks. And then another chunk, as Wendy mentioned, that are experiencing what we're seeing, the you know, demand shock. Um, they are actually um, well positioned to respond right now in the online learning space, sort of future of work and learning space in healthcare, um, trying to figure out how to actually then finance that growth and all the other challenges that go with the unpredictability of how long this demand will last as well. So those are some of the things we're seeing across our portfolio. Um, not necessarily along gender lines, lines at this point. I have some concerns about the female founded companies that have to go back out into the market and raise and what kind of bias will uh, sort of reemerge um, as more resources are scarce. And I'm sure we'll talk about that some more. 
We definitely will discuss that uh, more at length, Ali. <laughs> uh, but that's the perfect segue to my next question. Quickly, though, I do see one recurring thread uh, among all of your answers. And it seems to me that the agility and the ability to quickly pivot and meet a market need are all critical if companies want to come out on the other side of this pandemic. Uh, Ali, Normane, and Wendy, you all have touched on this a bit, but I want to dig in a little deeper. Are you all seeing any disparities based on sector, whether that's retail versus is healthcare, uh, geography, coastal America versus middle America, or even uh, globally, demographics or stage of companies? And if so, can you expound on that? I think Wendy, Wendy's muted. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so certainly what we're seeing is um, that they, Companies that are operating in the uh, sectors that are affected most by COVID are having a very hard time. So tourism, logistics, uh, services, retail, um, that, those are all really challenging. If those companies aren't able to find a way to pivot or, or just make their way through the, the process um, hunkered down, I think that's very challenging. But the, the most promising areas are obviously in healthcare, um, education and any kind of B2C type uh, businesses where uh, women are moving. And this is global. So our experiences with um, our partners uh, around emerging markets and uh, we're seeing this happen everywhere. It's not, it doesn't really discriminate. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's a pretty common, uh, even though the, the virus has really uh, impacted people, countries, different speeds and in different ways, I think the uh, what you're seeing sector-wise is pretty consistent. I think what, what I'm seeing in our portfolio um, is just really varied, nothing really geographical, or I'd say geography impacts the timeline. Um, so for example, we have a company uh, deploying in Latin America, manufacturing in China, and headquartered in San Francisco. So they were first impacted, the supply chain was first impacted in China, and then the stay in place order in San Francisco was the next thing to hit them. And then it was business development in Latin America. And so it was really interesting to see how the company was maneuvering. And when we checked in with them, uh, we were worried about supply chain and they said, oh no, that issue has been resolved. The lines are back up and running. Now we're having trouble um, getting a hold of our potential customers. So um, that's kind of, it's uh, flexibility is key, I would say. And I would add one sector that we spend a lot of time in um, that we're seeing a bit of a mixed bag in is financial health and financial inclusion. So um, we're seeing some slowdown in spending, of course, on the part of what would typically be a lot of the customer base for these companies. And at the same time, a real questioning of how to invest in technology to help people access financial services at a time when there is no ability or limited ability to, to physically go in person particularly in rural areas. So we're seeing some acceleration. Uh, we have a company in Tunisia, for example, that is really ramping up their activity because there are so many folks who cannot go into a bank right now. Um, but there are also, um, you know, several other folks in the space who are, who are struggling because their customer base has really just halted or, or slowed down spending. Obviously, we don't have a crystal ball to be able to definitively say what the future holds, uh, but let's hypothesize here for a minute. Do you believe that women are going to be disproportionately affected when it comes to raising money during the COVID-19 crisis that shows no signs of stopping, uh, and, and why or why not? Sure, I can, I can jump in. Um, Yes, to a certain extent, because the sectors that we see more women entrepreneurs in, uh, for example, we see a lot more women entrepreneurs in tourism, very badly hit by the crisis. Uh, we see more women entrepreneurs in education. Uh, if it's an online education solution, then they're probably going strong. But if it was something that involved a physical component or an in-person component, they've been severely impacted. So I'd say it's the sectoral skew that's going to have the, the biggest delta on, on, uh, on, on the impact the crisis has on businesses. Uh, 
Yeah, I would agree with that, Shruti. I think Christine sort of touched on this a bit already. You know, we, as we said, we don't know how this is going to impact women who are fundraising, but women and other underrepresented founders have, are at a disadvantage to begin with, um, as we've seen from various studies, um, largely due to implicit biases and I think homogeneous investor networks. And so while there are more women and investors at the table and more firms supporting women uh, and underrepresented founders, this group is still really limited. Think about even less than 10% of women, women are VCs um, and about 1% of VC firms are focused on diverse founders. And so I think it's you know, possible that the implicit biases we've seen uh, previously will be amplified now as investors are more conservative, more risk averse, and you know, retreat to their old behaviors and, and networks that are most familiar to them. So hopefully that's, that's not the case. And women who are at the helm of businesses that are growing during this time, such as you know, remote work, remote learning, um, businesses that are supporting communities or building communities like Alpha and Shine um, and those focus on mental health and wellness could, you know, really it, propel forward during this period and hopefully, you know, we'll look back and say we were able to help those women and it won't be a step backward. Yeah, I would echo what, what's being said in terms of, um, you know, it's already much more difficult to be um, raising capital as a founder that's um, where you're female or underrepresented minority or, or both even. Um, so that's already the case. I mean, some of the stats that I mentioned earlier. So it would be logical that when times are hard for everybody, um, even the, the white male founder from Stanford, that of course it's going to hit um, those who are having even, even harder time raising money, even when times are fine. So um, one of the things that I, I, I think that is also at risk is that you know, with the strides or progress that have been made in the last couple of years um, in terms of firms, um, you know, trying to make their best effort to recruit female GPs or have diversity initiatives um, that you can sort of start to see those cracks in terms of, you know, in times of crises that those sometimes are the first to go out the window or first to be kind of deprioritized. And it's probably because it's not really core to what they do. It's, it was like an add-on or, um, and you, you, we see this with sustainability initiatives um, um, with corporates that, that ultimately is what gets cut first because it's just, it was kind of a, a nice to have, um, which is unfortunate because it should be core to what you do. And, um, you know, for many firms, it's, 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 it's harder um, because they're not set up that way. Their networks aren't diverse and, you know, recruiting diverse deal flow you oftentimes hear the the reasons as to why it's hard, and it really, it's just um, you know they just don't. Um, in order to to source great deal flow from those networks, you have to actually go out and scout them, just like you would any other founder. But you know when when things are tough, you um, you know like like has been pointed out, you retreat to what you're familiar with. You focus on your own portfolio first. So if if investors are deploying new capital into new companies, um, you know th there is definitely a big risk that it's not, those dollars aren't going to go to the already low 2.8% that is going into female companies, let alone um, underrepresented minority female companies and, and, and other, other segments. If I could add to that, Christine, I would say that, you know, one of the ways that people of color on the investment side had been, you know, bypassing this was by raising their own micro funds. And so in the emerging manager community, there is also the, the fear that, we will lose momentum in some of the growth we, we've seen over the last five years with minority funded, mi minority founded firms. Um, so I, I, I think that that echoes your sentiment, right? Either large firms aren't bringing in um, diversity and then those who are launching their own funds as a way to, to bypass are also going to have trouble raising capital. Yeah, that's a great point. I think there's been, we're focusing a lot on founders um, and like everything, everything affects, you know, everybody. So like, a lot, like you mentioned, a lot of the, the GPs that are um, emerging managers um, or break off from other firms who, um, who don't have, um, you know, first time fund managers or emerging managers, um, they're going to also have more challenges raising capital, especially if they're, maybe if their thesis is to invest in um, more of a diverse portfolio. Um, so it all trickles, um, trickles down, certainly. Certainly. I did well, just, just, just want to offer. Oh, sorry. Sorry, can I just add a point yeah. to what Christine was saying, yeah. just to wrap it up? Uh, the other thing that's also impacting, as Christine said, female GPs is 
where in the fundraising cycle they happen to be. Because if right now they just ended an investment period, they, it's a double whammy, right? Because you need to exit in a market that's not conducive to exit, and you need to fundraise in a market that's not conducive to fundraising. So it's compounded. Yeah, I was actually similar point um, to what's just been shared. Coming from an emerging fund, um, we've actually seen just different conversations shifting from the LPs that we're raising from. So it's it's definitely affecting us as well. So I think that's definitely going to have an impact given I think most um, of the female GP growth um, within the VC industry has been at emerging funds. So it's just something that I think will, will have an effect long term. But um, for the founders out there, I, I did want to share just an, another perspective um, because we have seen a shift in how business is being done. Like we're having virtual connections versus maybe this more in-person, like you have to meet someone in person for coffee. Um, and I think that has actually opened up some opportunities. We've seen a couple of our portfolio companies connect with um, VCs that have been very vocal about the fact that they're still raising or still, sorry, still investing and are looking for founders in different ways. So instead of it being maybe the network driven approach, they've launched applications or have been hosting kind of virtual webinars and different things to connect with founders. Um, and we've seen it at essentially re uh, result in a couple of connections for our founders who are fundraising that wouldn't have had a direct connection kind of in the old way. Um, so I would say that's the only kind of light that I can, I can see in this, in this situation is that uh, being forced to do business differently has forced some VCs to alter how they're doing deal flow. Um, and you might be able to see or have access to, to some VCs that have been very much closed in their kind of personal networks before. Great. I'm so glad, right, before I go on to the next question, Brittany, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I know even in my own reporting, I know we're all in social isolation and we've pivoted to a really digital uh, digital first atmosphere, but it seems that that has democratized you know, and to an extent um, that access to a number of VCs and a number of investors. So going off from there, uh, another recurring thread in this particular, particular part of the conversation is that the coronavirus is affecting all companies to an extent and there's a good chance that on the fundraising side, those effects will be further compounded for women. And there's a fear of a regression on the progress that's been made. But as Kelly mentioned, there has certainly been progress in investment activity for female founders, albeit incremental and still fairly slow, and we still have a ways to go. Uh, in your opinions, what are some of the barriers to up in the, up in the capital that's out allotted to uh, female founders? How much time do we have? <laughs> I'm, Ali, you want to go? Okay, I'm happy to start here. You know, I, you mentioned, Ruth, um, incremental improvement. And um, I, was, uh, I was part of a call yesterday that was, uh, that was really talking about the difference here and the opportunity we have to reinvent what the future looks like. So when I think about um, how things change and what some of the barriers are, I, I find the conversation is very analogous to to STEM and when we started the STEM conversation, right? One of my, one of my pet peeves when I was in the corporate sector was hearing um, leaders talk about pipeline and talk about implementing K to 12 programs when I thought, man, the change is really needed at the top. And so thanks to my operations background and corporate background, you know, I, I think if we look at the whole system and we look at the value stream, I think onboarding more women as LPs is crucial. And I think uh, platforms like Portfolia are enabling women to do that and to really come in and invest in the type of company they want to see in the world. And that is critical. Um, more women as partners. So data, again, from the Kaufman uh, Research Center shows that women are twice as likely to invest in, in another, in a, in a female-founded company, um, especially in industries like consumer and software. So I think those two are critical. Um, and more than anything, it's about intention. It's about on outboard, uh, outbound recruitment. So it's not enough to say I'm open for business, you know, come come get some. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's about being intentional and out in the community and, uh, and transparent about intention so that there is this value alignment. 
Um, one thing I'll add that's less a barrier, even though I joked about being able to go on and on about barriers and more an opportunity that I think was emerging pre-COVID that I think could be um, further um, defined in this period is, is something that was talked about earlier, that women are actually better at generating revenue and thinking about different definitions of growth and what type of growth are, are we financing. So revenue-based financing was really making a, a sort of comeback in many ways um, over the last several months and years and looking at ways to um, support female founded companies who are able to generate sort of predictable revenue. Of course, that is hard for companies who are right now in a space where revenue is hard to come by, but for companies who are experiencing this opportunity or this way to pivot to generate revenue, I think that there's a real interesting potential move towards supporting companies who have more predictable growth in this market. And, and that has already, the data has already shown that there are a disproportionate amount of female founders that, that benefit from that approach. Yeah, um, I wanted to circle back. This is Wendy again. Um, I wanted to circle back to this point of, you know, reimagining the future and think about where, uh, you know, what things are kind of at an inflection point now that we might be able to continue as we go forward. And this question of, uh, you know, capital and how much capital is going into women founders in particular, it's really been gaining momentum. I think it's amazing what's happened in the last, you know, three to five years in terms of awareness in the industry about, uh, you know, wanting to put more funding into, um, into women. But I think what many people, as, as a result of this crisis, I mean, there's kind of two reactions. One is just heads down, let's get our way through the crisis. But the other is how do we need to do business differently in the future? And what is gonna you know, help us as a society globally more going forward? And I do see uh, an opportunity to try to bring more mainstream capital also into impact investing, whether it be climate, whether it be gender, um, in other areas. So I think we should also not forget the big picture about how do we really um, expand the conversation about gender lens investing to a much broader uh, range of investors uh, so that we're expanding the pie um, and you know, using the expertise of what I see as the true believers who have really been instrumental in creating this the space, uh, but to, to really make a much bigger impact um, in how capital overall is allocated to, to women and other you know, socially important um, issues. Thank you for that. Uh, it seems that a, a lot of great answers um, in terms of the barriers that we're facing and what it will take to remove these barriers or chip away at them. Uh, what I'm hearing is onboarding more women as LPs, more women as partners, and investors really having to make a concerted effort to move that needle forward and look at how much capital they're actually deploying to female founders. Uh, the pandemic and ensuing uncertainty have left many companies scrambling to maintain operations customers, projects, and their workforce. Uh, what advice, knowing that the majority of those tuning in are founders, what do you, advice do you have for them on how to function when faced with a capital crunch? What are some additional resources that female founders can tap into, whether that's in the public sector or in the private sector? Yeah, so I can, I can jump in quickly here. I think, um, you know, there are a variety of, of sources of funding and um, you know, outside of the PPP loans and, and some other government grants that we've heard about, I actually recently found out about a, a slew of, of government grants that or sources of funding that are available that you wouldn't necessarily think of, um, such as the US Navy, DARPA and Homeland Security are all expanding the scope of the type of businesses that they're offering funding to right now. And so I've actually shared that list with Ruth and the 500 startups team. It's, it's more, more robust than the three that I just mentioned, but we'll pass that along after the webinar. I thought it was pretty interesting that they're kind of expanding um, the businesses they're focusing on. So definitely check that out.
Yeah, maybe I'll just add, uh, because we work um, with the multilateral development banks who in turn work with both governments and with the private sector in emerging markets, um, you know, the, we really, in WeFi, try to take an ecosystem approach, which means targeting uh, the various ways women uh, re entrepreneurs receive support in their communities, whether that be uh, through banks, through funds, through, um, you know, their insurance uh, programs, but also on the policy side, uh, is there tax relief, is there, uh, you know, reductions in things like Social Security benefit payments uh, for on the temporary basis. Um, also, uh, you know, looking at more the social side of things, making sure the entrepreneurs and their employees in this time when everybody's homebound, have support that they need if they have things like gender-based violence going on in their in their homes, and that's a very, very big challenge. Um, and then also making sure there's training and capacity building. So I was really um, surprised. I saw a, a, a survey that was done um, that indicated that over 40% of uh, startups and small businesses in this global survey um, already were receiving some form of government support. Um, you know, didn't break down what the different forms were, but that's quite significant. And I think most countries have some programs that are there to support small businesses. My concern is that uh, men will be disproportionately accessing those, those programs, um, whether it's interest rate reductions or some kind of um, forgiveness on loans or, uh, you know, reduced payment schedule, uh, elongated payment schedules or it's grants from the government uh, of any kind. Uh, those programs are out there. They're, they will be out there if they're not out there yet. I mean, the World Bank and many other organizations are working with governments right now to stand those up. Um, obviously, we all know about the US uh, situation with the, with the grants and uh, lending programs. Um, but these are really important. And women who are now staying at home, having to you know, school, school their kids, take care and worry about their elderly parents, you know, manage all the household issues and run a business, uh, you know, just have a hard time, are, are gonna have a hard time finding the time to navigate all of these systems uh, if they don't have the right networks in place already, which is so often the situation for, for women. So definitely uh, important to avail yourselves of the different programs that are being stood up in different countries to support uh, businesses like yours. We are, so through Startup Catalyst, we have partnered with a number of seed funds globally, uh, including some of 500 startups funds in emerging markets. And we are actively trying to work with our seed funds to expand their ability to support startups during this challenging period. And so we're thinking of, of ways in which to make sure that they have capital so that startups are not left without during these trying times. Um, so, so that's sort of my advice. You can check out our portfolio if you Google IFC Startup Catalyst. Uh, you'll be able to see the funds that we've supported and uh, reach out to them. Um, and just real quick, I just dropped um, one of the links in the chat. Uh, we've seen a lot of, and I don't know, I think this one came out in March, so you kind of have to stay up to date on, on the deadlines of some of these grants, but there's a lot of essentially micro grants that we're seeing and we try to share with our portfolio. If you, if you see any opportunity that applies to you at this point, like um, you should probably try and try and apply and get that. Um, like I know Sarah Blakely has her, I think it's, it's $5,000 for female founded companies and that's still open. Um, but yeah, anywhere from like five, ten, twenty thousand dollars, we're seeing a lot of micro grants. So I just dropped one for I think they they did a roundup of female founder focused ones. Yeah, and I can give a quick plug to something that we're doing. Um, we've created in partnership with the Sorensen Impact Foundation the Abaca COVID Response Coalition, and it's uh, an opportunity to match startups who are responding in some way to the crisis, whether it's direct response or building a more resilient economy with investors that are actively looking for opportunities. So they're actually writing checks and I'll drop the link in the chat as well. 
Great, extremely helpful. Um, and I'll give Forbes a shameless, uh, shameless plug as well. We also have a number of roundups um, in terms of financial resources that can really help uh, startups, particularly female founded startups. Just two more questions before we wrap things up and, and turn it over to the Q&A segment uh, of this conversation. The survey data shows that female founders are primarily seeking monetary resources, which we've already discussed. But interestingly, they're also seeking mentorship. And Christine, maybe you can touch on this, but knowing this, how can investors and leaders within the startup ecosystem best support female entrepreneurs during this time? I think a lot of, you know, like focusing on like what, um, what is absent now in this period where majority of us are sheltering in place, it essentially eliminates um, a lot of what, um, a lot of resources that have been um, um, that that have been accustomed to for entrepreneurs and VCs, like the, the events, um, um, anything in person, of course, and um, and to some extent for certain programs, the in person component. Um, although, as we're seeing in, in what we're going through and others, that we're moving that um, a lot of that is now moving to virtual. So, um, but in in the absence of that, um, I mean, I think that you know the things that we're doing in terms of the accelerator is is moving that to um, you know a rolling admissions program and that is actually something that we had planned to do for a, a while even pre-COVID just you know, kind of coincidentally it works out during this time because um, it actually makes it better for founders in terms of um, we're trying to change it so that um, it's really more when founders are ready versus uh, us having to wait or them having to wait for a, you know schedule-based cohorts um, so definitely seeing that for um, a number of programs where they, they were already virtual or they were some mix of virtual or maybe they were completely offline, that that's certainly going to help, hopefully in terms of access, um, in terms of um, you know, having more access for, for founders and, and female founders to take advantage of those programs. And there's not the, the limitation of having to you know, uproot, relocate for a few months. Um, but in terms of like beyond, uh, you know, beyond the, the startup applications, I think that being just really, it, it is going to be, you know, proactive effort. So I think that's what we really have to challenge investors and leaders with um, in terms of supporting female founders. It's not, you, know, you can certainly say, continue to support female founders and diverse um, founders during this time. But, um, you know, thinking about like, how are you going to get that access to think about, um, you know, how, how you'll actually deliver that time or deliver that, that service to those. So I've definitely seen, um, you know, more access to content like this, like these webinars, um, and a number of folks have done that. And I think in terms of the, the re receiving information, that's helpful. Um, but I've also seen some investors and, and people um, doing things much more proactive in terms of like, um, like office hours or spending time with, with companies, obviously virtually, um, but it's, it's, you know, it may not completely replace the face-to-face the -face in person, but it's also potentially an opportunity to get time with investors or operators that maybe that wouldn't have existed before because um, either they wouldn't have had the, um, the, the impetus to do it or it would have been in person. Um, so in, any, in, in, in many ways, it hopefully makes it um, a bit more accessible um, in terms of, of the time. But I do think that um, having something very intentional, um, especially if it's not, um, especially if it's not, um, you know, it's kind of a weird, weird way to say it, but if it's not something that's kind of core to your thesis, um, it's, it, I think having that proactive step to, to reach out to diverse networks and say like, I would like to source deal flow from this, um, you know, from you and, and, and set up time and meet. Um, there's certainly people that you can partner with, either other firms or organizations that have access. You can start to build out and reach out to great founders that aren't in your, maybe your primary network. Um, so I think definitely the additional um, outreach is, is really key, um, just like it would be even without COVID in these times that um, oftentimes I think someone mentioned that it, it's often pointed to as a pipeline problem or all sorts of things. But really, it's like, like I mentioned before, if you are looking for great companies, they don't just come to you. You have to go actively scout these companies. And we do that even in the accelerator. As much as we get a lot of applications, we still go out and recruit and try to find great companies ourselves. And same applies like if you really are committed to having a diverse portfolio and you, you should do that because you'll you'll perform better that way you'll find great opportunities that people are not looking at and we've we've seen that many times um both in um both in founders as well as uh, geographies um and the the businesses that they serve um that you have to really go out and scout that deal flow and just really be proactive about it 
Um, otherwise, um, you know, it's just a vicious cycle, like no nothing will really change. I think Ruth, you're really asking, you know, how can we best support entrepreneurs? And, you know, I hear a lot of founders come and say, um, you know, I don't want dumb money, I want smart money. And, uh, and I always respond and tell them, I, I think what you should really be avoiding is oblivious money. Um, you know, you, you want an investor who is gonna, you know, who's gonna know their own limits and, uh, and check up on you and give you what you need when you need it. And so, um, you know, one recent example is, uh, you know, I use the Moms in Tech Facebook, Facebook group as a, as a proxy <laughs> for what is happening in, in uh, you know, in companies big and small. And, and I'm able to take that information and, and bring it back to, to our portfolio and to companies I'm, I'm having conversations with and, and share the, the mom and tech experience and how they may be able to shape some of their offerings and policies to be more, uh, to, to be more friendly and to improve retention. And so that is one value add that I never expected would come. And it just, it's, it's, uh, it's flowed based on, you know, a deep relationship of trust and respect. Yeah, I'm in that group as well. It's, it's a great resource. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a good point. I'm um, in terms of um, community groups online, like whether it's the Moms in Tech or um, I've seen, you know, a lot of this is probably on, in terms of platforms on Facebook groups or um, Slack groups. Um, but that's a, you know, I've, there's actually quite probably even more engagement now because you know, um, there's, um, that's, that's the primary way for, for this communication to happen, but it can be, you can capture some of that serendipity there, um, whether it's intros or feedback or, or hires or just advice. And um, that's a very good point. Great. It seems that with everyone working from home, it's really important to leverage uh, our, our shift to uh, the digital realm. Last question here for you all. And Wendy, you talked a, a bit about this, um, and I'd love to talk about it more at length. We've obviously discussed the fundraising aspect and the obstacles that that brings, but survey response, uh, respondents also noted that work-life balance, especially for caregivers, and customer acquisition are challenges as well. So how can founders uh, navigate these two issues and perhaps we can start with the work-life balance problem which as we know disproportionately impacts women. Um, yeah I, I mean I did touch on this before but um, we know uh, women and I think this was uh, part of the opening remarks as well women are really disproportionately affected by COVID. They're uh, you know, they're, they're, they're taking care of their children's education now. Um, they're managing their elder care um, responsibilities. They're often uh, in, you know, difficult domestic situations and uh, violence against women has really uh, skyrocketed during this crisis. Um, women are more likely to employ other women who are in similar situations. And we all face the, just the day-to-day -day, uh, process of managing you know, a household and being at the house all the time. It's a very different dynamic. And so uh, you know, in other ways, though, I think being home can help. This fact that you know, no one's going to conferences, no one's glad-handing, you know, no one's going and schmoozing to, to make the connections. Everybody's doing that online. It's a, it, it can be a more efficient process. And I think people are more open to that kind of digital connection now. So I think it's really important to leverage the, those um, those ways of working. But also, you know, there's there will be a need for some women to uh, you know step back and put a pause on you know different parts of their lives, and you know some will need to to step forward um, and and do more. And I think the other element of this is the employees, right? Because you all have employees who have the same situations where they have to say, you know, I'm, I'm out, I need to manage, you know, more complicated things here. And how do you work um, through that in your, you know, startup businesses, which have very few employees anyways. So I think that has to be done, obviously, with a lot of empathy, um, you know, but also an eye, eye to the future and what you need to do to make it through. Mm. I think and there's a comment on the chat related to this. I think this kind of goes back to the bias problem too. So um, a founder who is juggling like 
schooling their kids, trying to run a company, doing 10 million other things um, is a founder that like I get really excited about. Um, and I think and most of us who are women, like we know that that's a woman who can get stuff done and be a successful entrepreneur. Um, I think there is going to be some education that's required around that. I think that it's up to many of us to continue to be as loud as possible um, to talk about how navigating work-life balance um, is actually a, an indicator of someone who has the type of grit that it takes to run a successful company. So I would just encourage all of us in this, the broader us to, to continue to advocate um, for the skill set that women uniquely have in this environment. And I think there will be a lot more understanding of that, those challenges going forward amongst male and female uh, investors. Thank you for that. Um, and and I just, before we end things, I also do want to touch on the fact that customer acquisition has presented itself as a challenge. So what advice tips do you have on navigating that? And I'm assuming it goes back to being agile and, and that ability to quickly pivot. You know, one of our, I, I, one I, of our go ahead, Norma. One of our portfolio companies is reinventing the high heel shoe and uh, their production stopped in Italy and uh, they're, not, they're not promoting this product at the moment, but one of the things they are doing in the meantime is really building community online. And so they're, they're bringing astronauts and epidemiologists and, uh, and really exciting speakers um, online for candid discussions. And so that is one way they're building community um, and hopefully nurturing a network that could, that could become customers in the future. Yeah, I think Norma's example. Go ahead, Brittany. I can jump in after. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a portfolio company as well that, um, in a similar way, has been able to really build community and thinking about customer acquisition in a more longer term sense. Um, so, this company is called Bippy. They make uh, eco friendly toilet paper. And then they have totally kind of rethought how to build their brand and customer acquisition through um, essentially a, a phone line. They've actually called it butt dial and they have basically an open two hour uh, open conversation with people who just want to chat and they've had incredible success with people really identifying with their brand and and essentially trying to build that community online where people might just want to reach out to someone and they've found that to be really successful and it doesn't necessarily align with with just the um, eco-friendly toilet paper line. It's like thinking about how they can uh, build brand and customers uh, and add value long-term. Um, I was, I, I think both Brittany and Nora may captured exactly what I was gonna say. Um, marketing is a space where you can cut budget easily without the pain of having to deal with staffing uh, issues and so typically marketing is where entrepreneurs are uh, you know retain not spending as much money and retaining cash but there are ways to to keep your brand or company top of mind in a manner in, in through means that don't cost a lot of money. And I think Norma's example and Brittany's example capture that, where you're trying to build community through uh, engagement and activation online without having to spend uh, money on marketing. So you're, con you're conserving dollars for, for spending in the future so that you can actually acquire customers, but now you're building your community before you actually get to that point. Yeah, and I think just to, to build on that, we actually at Harlan Capital had Edelman come in and share um, some updates from their COVID-19 trust barometer study. And they had some really interesting takeaways, um, which of course first are with revisiting and revising your marketing strategy to reflect the current environment. Um, and really not to disappear during this time, but to use your brand position to make a positive impact. Um, and they found that 90% of consumers actually expect brands to do this. And um, will engage more with, with those types of brands. I also thought it was interesting. They said that a third of consumers said they stopped using a brand that didn't respond appropriately. So really just being mindful during this time. And as Brittany noted, kind of creating a community that is supportive 
um, of your of your consumers is really important. So I think also you might want to know 85% uh, of consumers said that brands should be an educator during this time and offer information to, to help. Um, and is, that is relevant to the current environment and also noted that they do want to see brands on social media, as Brittany said, again, you know, fostering the sense of community. So I think, you know, being present during this time, you know, can seem a little bit intimidating, but it's really important and, and people are paying attention. I think that's a great place to end. Um, yet again, a number of really compelling threads. Community, well, first of all, uh, brand optics matter. Uh, community and audience or consumer engagement are, are, are key. And yet again, you can leverage digital platforms uh, to really leverage that. We'll now move on to the Q&A segment, the juicy part of the conversation. Uh, and the first question for you all, do you believe that a mixed gender team will be as impacted as a solo woman founder team in terms of fundraising? What is your experience about this? You know, I mentioned a few data points from the from the Kaufman Fellow Research Center, and it's important to note that anytime they talk about um, you know, the impact to women, it's always at least one woman on the founding team. So um, I think the impact is uh, the same. I would, I, I think I would disagree a little bit. I think a, a solo founder uh, for a company is just a very challenging place to be, whether you're male or female. And having two co-founders helps um, share the burden, but also gives more perspectives. And so, so I actually think that if you're more than one founder, whether you're mixed gender or same gender, I think that makes a difference. Uh, uh, and I agree with Norma in terms of like, you know, having at least one female, I completely agree with the statistics on that, but I think it's more in terms of one versus two, as opposed to one woman versus one woman and a man. Great. Uh, next question. As a female immigrant founder and now trying to become a female GP, uh, I mostly have had to deal with more men than women, which makes sense considering the numbers mentioned above. Do you think that with all the changes that will take place in doing business post COVID, including possible democratization of deal flow, there will be better opportunities for women, not just in our ecosystem, but overall? I think this is going to be a challenge. Um, and I think this was touched on at the beginning of the panel um, that emerging fund managers are going to get hit harder um, in this in this crisis and sort of in its aftermath. And at the end of the day, uh, this changes when the holders of capital change. So when we have change either insisted upon by LPs um, or who the LPs are changes. Um, I, I'm hopeful that philanthropy can and will step up here. I know there are some initiatives on, amongst a number of foundations to try to change this dynamic. Um, I think they're going to have to carry a heavier load um, for, for some time. But uh, I'm also hopeful um, that we will continue to have more and more emerging managers and then non-emerging managers that are, um, that are more diverse than what we've got now. But I think it's going to take a little time. Yeah, I think hopeful is a key word uh, going forward. Uh, the next question here, uh, and I really like this one, uh, what is your belief relative to the gig economy that has been affected by the pandemic? Do you think the demand for those services will fundamentally be shifted? Um, and this questioner referenced Uber, Lyft, PassRabbit, et cetera, in particular. Uh, if someone is speaking, I can't hear you. You're likely muted. I, 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 I can take that one if no one else wants to. Um, the, the, gig, the, the nature of the gig economy has changed uh, during these, these times of lockdown, right? And, um, the, the, the question, and I don't think I have an answer to it, but the question is, will this temporary lockdown change our consumption patterns going forward? 
And I don't think any of us know the answer to that question. I don't think the gig economy is going away, but I think the nature of the gig economy could change depending on how consumption patterns are impacted. Yeah, this is actually a very timely question. Um, I, uh, good uh, co-investor and uh, friend and um, a founder we invested in in the early days, uh, Leah Sullivan, who founded TaskRabbit, she actually wrote a really good uh, thought piece on this in Fast Company. I think it was just published yesterday. Um, and it, it brings a point on the fact that the gig economy currently is pretty broken with respect to, to the gig workers in terms of, um, you know, what sort of like classification they are, what sort of rights they have, and just how, how much it impacts them and the, the, the types of, um, you know, folks who do work with Uber, or Lyft, TaskRabbit, and, and other, you know, gig marketplaces um, and their sources of in income. And given the nature of, you know, shelter in place and um, how much of a hit these businesses have taken subsequently they're taking an even bigger hit not having access to that um, um, incremental income so um, but it, it really kind of shined the light on the workers themselves and um, trying to fix that model um, and i think shruti brings up a great point about just how the businesses themselves are impacted because the demand is down um, but that it's not going away um, but that the nature potentially certain sectors um, would be um, impacted either temporarily or long term. And I, I forgot there was someone who mentioned, I don't know if it was um, Brittany, about a, a company um, that, not sure if it's quite the gig economy, but um, kind of a marketplace to help, um, I think, like care, caregivers, right? Training caregivers. And I'm not sure if they were considered kind of independent um, or part of an organization that would um, um, you, you would recruit caregivers from, but kind of similar, similar example where it sounds like that company is doing um, better, maybe because there is demand. Um, so, um, but it, it is definitely, um, it is definitely, um, you know, something to consider, especially with, with some of these different types of gig economy companies, what percentage are female of these, of the, of the, uh, the workers that sign up um, versus male and, and, and certainly in terms of demographics, like underrepresented versus not. And, um, like how we how we can make that experience uh, kind of protect those workers better, or these companies can protect the workers more. All right, and very quickly, I also think it's important to note in respect to this question that yes, while we're seeing con uh, lowered consumer demand for for Uber drivers, uh, we are seeing an uptick for things like Uber Eats. So we're, that's a prime example of where we're seeing a shift. Next question, uh, as a female and minority founder with a biotech startup responding to COVID-19, in addition to capital, reaching out to female mentors to help guide us through this rapid growth and response period has been relatively difficult. What is the best way to go about this in your opinion? I mean, one thought um, without, I mean, just, just reading the, the question and, and hearing it um, without knowing kind of the, you know, the additional context is um, just definitely keep in mind um, that, you know, every, everybody is, is quite um, distracted, of course. Um, and as we talked about the additional burden on women, um, if reaching out to female mentors, it's possible that that, that may be the case. But um, I think that in terms of going about it, um, I mean, I, I've definitely seen that there's, there's a lot of cold outreach that generally happens in terms of um, getting access to help or questions and um, that the response rate there may be um, low just because it's cold outreach. But I'm curious if, if the question is um, around female mentors that it's cold outreach or people that they know or maybe a mix of both. Um, but um, I think at least for our founders, I think what we've seen that has been helpful is they, they obviously continually, uh, you know, continually try to follow up and, and um, at least try to get warm, um, you know, try to get intros to, to people from at least their, within their own networks, and then it kind of propagates from there. But um, I think one thing to be, um, uh, one, one thing to try to um, be resourceful on is, is some of the resources that I think the panel has mentioned in terms of where people are um, maybe even more proactively putting out um, virtual time or office hours. And I would say definitely just um, persist as much as you can. Um, it is going to be hard even for, for the, the male founders and just founders in general to get people's attention. I mean, even myself as a you know, GP, it, it is hard to get attention from, um, from you know, even co-investors or even our own founders because everyone is just um, very distracted. 
When we were running our accelerator program, we always asked uh, we always asked the CEOs to build their bench list. Right? We said if you could pick anyone in the world to advise your company, who would it be? And and generate that list, and then start to slowly find. Um, intersections. You know, maybe it's a synergy in what you both care about. Maybe it's a mutual connection. Maybe you can go to an, an event where they're speaking. Um, it's hard. It's harder to do that now, but that is one exercise that could be helpful. And then I would say, um, really uh, finding community with other people building the same same type of company in the same industry in the same sector. Um, that could be a way to share resources uh, on the on the advisor or mentor level. But uh, I would echo what Christine mentioned. You know, I saw a question come up earlier that said, I reached out to all of you and I haven't received a response. And, you know, if I could, uh, if I could show you my, my inbox, it, it's, uh, it's insane. So be be patient, um, be cognizant of the fact that we're all a little distracted and overwhelmed. Yeah, I would just to, to add some some ideas around resources that uh, Nora May and Christine mentioned. I know um, at least at Harlem Capital Partners, we actually worked with Female Founders Fund uh, last week or two weeks ago to host open office hours. So definitely keep your eye out on those, you know, our two channels to, to see when we're hosting the next one. That's a great opportunity just to sort of get FaceTime and advice from investors right now. And as Norma May mentioned, you know, joining communities that are supportive. I think Alpha is a great resource for women in tech um, and they're a growing online community. So I would encourage you to check that out too. Uh, as an editor at a legacy publication who covers DNI, I echo Norma's sentiments that uh, my inbox and voicemail are inundated uh, with outreach. So patience is definitely key. A couple more questions here. With a Lumen recession, what are your thoughts on international trade opportunities regarding Africa and other emerging markets? Um, maybe I'll I'll kick off. I mean the the uh, global recession. I think the all indicators are that it's going to hit um, every continent. Um, I think Africa now is looking at uh, a recession and negative growth rates um, for the first time. I think I saw in 30 years. So uh, it's going to be very challenging. In some ways, I don't think they've seen the the same um, impacts as they've seen other ways, but now uh, that everyone is so interconnected, the decline in growth uh, everywhere is, has you know, ramifications um, uh, and the shutdowns have ramifications everywhere. So um, I think you, you are gonna see some retrenchment in those global trade flows. We've already seen them. We've seen re major retrenchments in capital flows um, to emerging markets. Uh, and so I think it's it's similar to what we're we've been talking about um, in the past, where those sectors that are uh, really essential sectors um, that still have their value chains uh, effectively up and running are going to be really critical. But I do think there's going to be a lot more you know need to build up domestic and regional value chains and and trade uh, trade channels. So. Um, you know, I would say watch this space. Uh, we don't know what exactly is going to happen with uh, with value chains and, and capital flows going forward. Um, there, are, there are already issues around de-risking and, and uh, getting you know flows of funds between Africa and other uh, other regions. Uh, so I think it's going to be um, it's going to be a, a volatile run for the next uh, six months, year or longer. Uh, another another uh, question is what is the role of LP? I mean, this is actually a twofold question. What is the role of LPs in funding more emerging managers? Uh, and secondly, what are their key challenges to invest in more in emerging funds? I can take that. Um, so the, the 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 challenge with funding emerging managers, the challenges that always exist, continue to exist. But the part that's compounded is typically when you're when you're adding a new fund manager to your portfolio, you're it's a new relationship, and you're doing a much deeper 
level of diligence as opposed to re-upping into a fund that you already have exposure to. Um, and with the, the lockdown restraints, in-person diligences have stopped completely. And, and so you're now having to do a virtual due diligence of a manager that you've never met in person. And I think that inherently is a, a huge challenge to overcome. So what, what, what we, we see happening more often now is for fund managers where, you know, it's their second fund, which is still relatively emerging. I mean, it's not a Sequoia or an Axel, but uh, it's still relatively emerging. The, the, fund ma the LPs are willing to do a virtual diligence um, to, to, to get the funders in going. But if it's a first time fund, it's, there are lots of LPs who are holding off on decision making till they can actually do a full in person on the ground diligence. And I think that is going to be the biggest challenge during this time for uh, emerging managers. The other thing, uh, the other challenge that we're starting to see is it, for emerging managers, getting a lot of institutional capital can sometimes be challenging. So they do tend to have a fair amount of their uh, investment flows coming from high net worth individuals. With, the, with markets losing a reasonable portion of value, which means some of which has recovered, um, the, the capital available for people to, to deploy into more risky strategies has reduced in size. And so for, for fund managers raising um, their first fund and looking to a lot of h and uh, those can be uh, the challenges they face. That being said, we're still seeing uh, first-time fund managers close funds uh, during this time, um, I saw in the questions, there's a question from Claire, and I know they just had their first close uh, in, in March. Uh, so so they are uh, fund managers who are still early in their journey as a fund manager um, achieving closes, but it's just more challenging than it typically is uh, for an emerging manager. All right, well, let's wrap things up on that note. Thank you so much, panelists, for providing that wealth of knowledge. And I will now turn the reins over to Christine for final remarks. All right, well, that was a great conversation. Um, and hopefully those of you tuning in got um, some helpful tips and resources out of it as you navigate your journeys, either as a founder or a, a GP or, or whatever your role is. Um, but thanks everyone on the panel for their time and participation and insights. We do have a webinar that's coming up on May 21st with LPs that addresses the importance of investing in diverse teams. So definitely look forward to that. Um, as for more on um, the 500 Female Forces Initiative, you can go to, uh, I believe, femalefounders.500, 500.co to, um, to learn more and access other resources. But thank you everyone again for tuning in and thanks to this great panel and special thanks to Ruth for, for a great moderation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks all. Thanks all.